Okay, what we want to talk about here, guys, today is the role of instrument-assisted techniques as in the role of pain management. And really, that's what it's, when patients come to see us, they're in pain. Okay, welcome. Come on in. And, and let me move this stack down here where you guys can feel like you guys can reach, but feel free to grab them. Okay? So, again, to summarize, my name is Sean Berger. I'm a physical therapist in private practice up in Northern California. I have been involved in instrumentation uh, for over a decade, and that is utilizing metal or plastic or other forms of instrumentation for soft tissue work. The first question I always get when I do augmented soft tissue is why am I utilizing an instrument versus my hands? Quite, quite simply, there's a, a very, very simple answer to that, and that is more specificity. So when I go to a patient, and yes, I can come in and I can feel an issue here, somebody with a lateral epicondylopathy, and I can feel that tenderness, I am still using a broad surface of force against a broad surface of the body, okay? So when I can approach a patient utilizing some form of instrument, essentially what I'm doing is driving the force through a mechanical smaller area. And what all the different instrument companies out on the market have done is to dry, basically design a beveled edge, try to bring that force into a specific edge. Where did instrumentation come from? Very simple, it's been around actually for a couple thousand years, but in Western United States, Western medicine, it really came from a patient who developed a bad patellar tendinopathy, and what he noticed is, is his therapist was doing Syriax cross friction massage, cross friction massage. And you know what that patient did? He said, hey, that feels good, but how do I do that at home? And so he went home and he's literally trying to self-massage his patellar tendon, thinking this is kind of goofy. And so what he ended up doing was literally taking like a number two pencil that has those convex edges on it. And he took that number two pencil and he just went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth and said, whoa, hey, that feels better. Guys, that happened in the early 1990s. And here we are in 2017. And so between then and now, we've seen an evolution in taking that number two pencil right here and doing a little Syriax cross friction massage to saying, hey, where can we take this? And so when you see a product like Hot Grips and you see all these different instrumentations, I always tell them, my clients the same thing. The technique is exactly the same with all of the instruments. All we're doing, and the reason we have many different instruments, is they just each give us mechanical advantages over one another. So if I'm working on somebody's elbow, or maybe on someone's neck or TMJ, a smaller instrument is gonna give me maybe more specificity than if I am using, how do I treat a TMJ with this? A little bit more challenging. But if I'm treating a thigh or a lower leg or a big, you know, a larger person's upper trap, this, this instrument can give me leverage, okay? And so again, please hear that when we do the technique, it's the same with all the instruments, it's just what instrument gives you the best mechanical advantage. The other thing I always t t tell people about when we talk about instrumentation is what is the product made out of? When you research and you look and say what's going to be best for my patients, there's products that are made out of animal material, bones, literally, okay, Sh shells, things of that nature. There are materials that are plastic, there are materials that are made out of metal. I have been doing this for over a decade. My preference is metal for two main factors. Number one, I can ensure cleanliness. When I'm working on a patient and I leave the patient, I can spray this with a cavicide and I know that I can kill, bacteria, kill things and I can move on. I can't say something that's porous, a plastic or a bone, what's getting in there. So for me, cleanliness. The other thing that we find is we find that the metal resonates. So almost like using a stethoscope that would magnify our heartbeat, the metal edges, when you go over tissue, you'll feel those reverberations, that bump, 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 that bump, 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 and you're like, wow, I feel something, okay? So if we take an item like a lateral epicondylopathy and we start thinking about what are the mechanics of a dysfunctional elbow that leads to lateral epicondylopathy, well, first of all, almost always there's going to be some limitation in extension. Now, here we have a great example where we say this is hypermobile, but is it? Have we assessed it bilaterally? Maybe her normal is 15 to 20 degrees of hypermobility, and in fact, she's only going 10 degrees, in which case, technically, she would be hypomobile. But typically what we find in the clinic with lateral epicondylopathy or medial epicondylopathy is a dysfunction in elbow extension. And why is that? Primal movements, guys. We lift, we push, we squat, we pull. The triceps gets really aggressive. The other key component, obviously, is an overactivation of supinator. So we'll typically find that the supinator, the radial ligament, annual, annual ligament is tender. And then that causes excessive use of what? The common extensors, correct? And so then you get this diffuse pain through the common extensors. So if I could tidbit what we would do with instrumentation on a lateral epicondylopathy is I would take some emollient, 
because we're applying this directly on the skin. I'm just going to cover up. If it looks like we're buttering toast, that's what it is. And then every instrument company out there, and again, we're partial to Hox Grips. We feel that they are kind of industry leaders. They are, some of them are going to have double beveled edges, which are a little softer, nicer. Some are going to be single beveled edges, meaning coming in at a very more ob uh, ob oblique and, a, and a, an abrupt angle. So I would literally approach this patient, and I would come in here at about a 45 degree angle, and I'm just going to work those common extensors. And I'm going to work all the way up across the epicondyle into where the deltoid insertion will get this kind of fibrotic overlap between the deltoid insertion and the various muscles that go into the brachioradialis and so forth, common extensors. Very common. Our patient's like, what are you doing? Kind of gets tense. And I'll encourage them to relax. Now, I am demonstrating this to you right now, and I'm kind of standing awkwardly. In the clinic, I would be engaged in this position that would allow me to control the elbow and go from extension with wrist flexion into more flexion to shorten the tissue. Because if I shorten the tissue, I can go deeper. But I realize in this setting, I'm blocking your view a little bit. So I'm going to come back to here. But I, we really want to approach this understanding physiology, the mechanics, shortening the tissue, lengthening the tissue. So again, for a lateral pecondylopathy, three targets, OK? Common extensors. So I'm going to work through here, common extensors. The redness that you're seeing is really just a histamine response that's occurring. That will go away very aggressive, very quickly. I'm going to switch to a single beveled edge, which will feel a little sharper, a little more acute. And I'll work through that. And I'm going to alter the tissue length. Maybe I'll put her into a stretch position. And oh, there's some good gristle right through there, OK? And I can really work that tissue. She's used this arm with overhead activities. Can you imagine? OK, a little volleyball here or there. Oh, and I just want to spend some time there. I mean, that just feels so easy for me as a clinician. <laughs> I'll tell you, when I was, I do manual therapy with about 90% of my patients. After a few patients of you digging in with your thumbs, we've all been there, and you're shaking out your hand. I have coworkers at 9.30 in the morning. They're looking at me across the gym, and they're doing this. Why? They're abusing their hand. Now, I can sit here. I can talk about X, Y, Z. It's so light in my fingers, and I'm able to get in and aggressively work, in this case, those common extensors. Okay? Now, I mentioned three targets for lateral epicondylopathy. Common extensors is the no-brainer. We all get that. We're going to soft tissue it and stretch it. But guys, triceps insertion. So for this lab, I'm just going to take her hand up on her head because it's easy for you guys to see. But our triceps insertion here, because of all the lifting, pushing activities that we do and functional activities, guys, this gets really gristly, really gristly collagen that's been laid down there. So I'm literally going to come in here. I'm going to hold this simply like a, like a pencil, so light in my fingers. And I'm tissue tensioning with my non-instrumented hand. How are we doing? It's going to be intense. It's going to be intense. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to work that triceps insertion. Now, this is the area that I think over 50% of clinicians, for just we get busy and we forget about, and it's a major component to lateral epicondylopathy. So this is clinic level A, you know, kind of 101. But how can I take this patient to a higher level? Let's go ahead and go prone briefly down at this end. So we would, with your arm hanging off the table, so we're going to go face down, all the way down. So now I can go on a treatment table, I'm going to scoot you toward me, just, and have that arm supported by the table. And then literally now come in this position and work that triceps there. Now she's hiding her face because there's an intensity there now that she didn't realize was there, okay? You get, I was doing this program uh, at BYU and their trainers were so excited to use it with their linemen because why these linemen are coming up, bang! bang and they're pushing and all day long they're banging these and they have so many elbows and finger issues and so here you take a 300 pound lineman and now all of a sudden you put them prone and you block that and now I'm in here with this instrument which you might not even think is appropriate for the elbow but I'm in here like this and I'm just really working that triceps and what could I do to engage the fascial layers deeper is I could have her create an isometric contraction push into me and push into me and feel the intensity increase there. Yeah. And then I could take her to higher level functions. Let's go into a push up or a plank position. So now she's loaded and, and up on the hand. So now she's loaded and now come back down into right there. She's loaded and now I can work the triceps there. Maybe I can progress her to doing push ups on a BOSU or something of that nature. And I can really work that triceps. I can make her squirm 
If she didn't pay her copay or was 10 minutes late, I could get into her, okay? <laughs> but the point is, look at how easy this is on me. And I'm able to get into those tissues, into the triceps. Three points to lateral pachondylopathy. Common extensors, triceps insertion. Let's sit back up. The third point, which 75% of us always forget about, and I've, I've forgotten about it many a times, the soft tissue around the, ra the, the annular ligament, the radial head. Guys, this gets overactivated. So the best way to access that is to have your patient come in and help you out. Shorten that arm. I like it about 90 degrees so that you basically can relax the brachioradialis. Otherwise, if they hold their arm up here, there's too much resting tone of that brachioradialis. So we bring it back here. She's holding it. It goes limp. I literally, with my non-instrumented hand, pinch that brachioradialis and I pull it laterally out of the way so that I can take a mechanical instrument, in this case the knob here, slide right underneath and drop down. Now you see that reaction. That's the reaction that says, wow, my therapist knows what he's doing, okay? And, and that's the reaction that gets their patient to come back because that, no one's touched them there before. No one knew that that hurt, okay? Doctor didn't do it. Doctor just sent them to therapy, okay? So my point is, if I really felt like I needed to get even more specific, look at the size of that hook. If we think we can drive force in there, and I can drive that hook right down in there, guys, I'm pushing like a feather. She's, she's going to give me a left a hip and a middle finger reflex really quickly. But the point is, I'm getting now on the sweet spot, okay? So common extensors, notice I always end with that, because if I start with that, they're not as happy. But I do the common extensors, and I'm kind of joking when I say that, right? But I want my patients engaged. Common extensors, triceps okay, in various positions, loaded and unloaded, and then the soft tissue mobilization. Do I do mobilizations of the radial head? Yes. Do I do strengthening, eccentric strengthening in particular? Yes. I'm not saying this is a be-all, end-all for lateral pachondylopathy. There's many other things we can do. Do I kinesio tape it? Yes. Love it. Do I use biofreeze? Love it. But from a purely instrument station standpoint, that's kind of my, my go-to moves for that. Again, three things, common extensors, triceps, soft tissue of the radial, uh, radial head, okay? Questions on that, okay? Uh, yes? So do you just, for, on a billing standpoint, do you just bill that as So the question is, on a billing standpoint, what do we approach that as? Yes. Now, I practice in Northern California, so I'll bring that into my manual therapy codes. Now, in, not, in every practice state's gonna be a little bit different. If I'm doing a lot of dynamic activities, okay? My patients come in with plantar fasciopathy. Where does plantar fasciopathy hurt? Does it hurt when they're lying prone on the table where we treat them or does it hurt when they're walking? It hurts when they're walking. So I do all my instrumentations in the position of provocation. I do it when they're walking. So if I'm treating them with soft tissue in the loaded position, could I show that? Would you slip off a shoe? Okay. Now I might say, or the triceps there, I could justify that as a Therex or an activity code you have to decide, and again, why would I look at that? Which one pays better or more efficiently, okay? So somebody coming in for plantar fasciopathy, very common, we're gonna treat them on a table, maybe supine, long sitting, prone. We're gonna maybe do our ultrasound, we're gonna do our stem, we're gonna do our soft tissue. I have yet to have a patient tell me that their foot hurts when they are on the table. So I just ask ourselves, why are we treating there? And it's a rhetorical question, because it's easy for us as clinicians. So I am gonna do my soft tissue treatment here. I'm gonna show the love in this position, most likely prone, I'm gonna, but I'm gonna to try to get him in the position of provocation. So if we would, let's go ahead and stand up for a moment because that's where they hurt, okay? So actually, if you would, go prone for me briefly so I can have your foot here. So go uh, face down. Okay, so the mechanism of injury on a, mechan on a, on a plantar fasciopathy is that plantar fascia pulling off the anterior part of that rear foot, okay? So this is, provocation in that regard. If I do aggressive instrumentation distally, it tends to flare up or poke the bear a little bit. So I will come in here, kind of first portion of that. I didn't even ask you if you're ticklish, okay? But I will literally just take that beveled edge and work toward the rear foot, okay? And I'll work that in maybe three, four, five minutes, not 15. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure, again, they have a proper wind last mechanism, that the first ray is extending properly. I'm going to do, most likely, all the things that you're doing. But ultimately, guys, I'm going to take them into the position of provocation. And if I can you know, tease you with that tidbit, it's powerful. Let's stand up. Because she's coming to me hurting when she's walking in the morning and with pain. Let's face away from me there. 
And so literally, I'm going to go in and treat the kinetic chain. I'm going to treat her calf. I'm going to treat into the hamstrings, into the Achilles tendon. But my go-to move on the soft tissue then is literally, bring this foot back, is I'm gonna have, go teach them to do a simple heel raise. So we're gonna go into a heel raise. If they need to you know, balance or cue to touch on something, that's great. But now I have exposure to there. Weight bearing, loaded, position of provocation, come back down. So now I'm gonna go ahead and do the heel raise again. And as I do that, I'm going to take that instrumentation very lightly, guys, just like we did on the triceps. And I'm gonna work into that plantar fascia loaded because loaded is the key that's where they hurt they don't hurt passively do i do this visit one no it's a little aggressive but my goal is to get them here again the value to you is we're driving force through a specific edge to create that change in the tissue okay the value to the patient i'm going to tell you right now is that this is much more engaging than quite honestly to be somewhat sarcastic having a tech put ultrasound on them for eight minutes that they really can't feel let's go again one more time and again i'll work right into that rear foot right through that okay and that gives us some great opportunity to create some change in that okay let's go set back on the table why do we do instrumentation i mentioned earlier it comes out of the field of recreating the inflammatory cascade. David, uh, Syriax is cross friction. It came out of doing that on the knee. Most clinicians approach it mechanical theory. I feel tenderness, let me go in and chisel it out. I feel pain, let me go break it out. There's research to support that. But there is also growing research that says that maybe it isn't just a mechanical issue. Maybe there's their neurosensory. Maybe the afferent stimulus is allow and working through what, gate control theory working through pain and so from a simple pain management maybe just light brushing or strumming it deals with it from a pain standpoint so mechanical theory yes neurosensory is the other and then we're seeing a growing trend for people that are in the environment where they're doing like lymphedema fluid exchange of using broad-based concave surfaces to literally mechanically push the fluid push the swelling instead of the traditional again using the hands so we can push swelling over a swollen ankle over over a, an elbow and push it up kind of to the next chain in that lymphatic drainage so mechanical theory yes we feel tension in an area break it up neurosensory yes i know a therapist who works in a skilled nursing home in san jose california that has patients with strokes and instead of just standing with the gate belt and walking her down the hallway, she has this instrument here and she's going up and down the back, the QL, trying to facilitate some afferent input. So mechanical theory, sensory, sensory theory, sensory motor, okay, from a pain control standpoint and fluid. When you leave here today, if you haven't paid attention, when you watch some Big Ten basketball, you watch some NFL games, every once in a while pay attention because I'm going to guarantee you, I saw, it, I saw it in the Super Bowl. I saw it on some of the big bowl games last year. You'll see trainers in the game utilizing the instruments on the players. Why would they use it in the game on a player? Certainly not from a mechanical standpoint. They don't want to hurt them. They're strictly, Loma Linda, very nice. Strictly using my alma mater. Very cool. Sorry, I got, got caught off with that. But they're strictly utilizing the instruments in that setting from a maybe fascial component, treating, treating pain, things of that nature. Okay, so the take home message guys, if you're not familiar with instrumentation, it's driving force through a specific edge. The advantage in my opinion of metal instruments is cleanliness, keeping it sterile, okay? And a better resonation than using animal products and plastics in my opinion. I want you guys to experiment with that. And then the three main things that we know that it works for, mechanical, breaking up collagen lesions, okay? Recreating the inflammatory cascade, neurosensory and fluid exchange. Questions on any of that? Okay, thank you guys.